Hi folks, welcome back. So, in our quest to make music, we've made a few really cool bleepy bloopy machines along the way, but we need a way to reliably control those machines in order to make something that's actually musically useful. And that's what we're going to do today. We're going to work on a thing called a MIDI to CV converter. So this takes digital note information in the form of MIDI notes and turns them into control voltages that we can put straight into our synthesizers and use them to make those bleeps and bloops that we've become so fond of. This is our sawtooth core oscillator, and this is the microcontroller that we're going to design this time. So this is taking this keyboard and converting it into a control voltage which is driving this oscillator. But first, in order to decode a MIDI message, we need to understand what a MIDI message actually is. MIDI is an 8-bit serial protocol, which just means that we receive little 8-bit packets one bit at a time. So 8 bits in a packet is called a byte, and MIDI is split into three distinct bytes. The first byte is the status byte, which tells us what type of MIDI message we're going to get. And then the next two bytes tell us information about that type of byte. By looking at all of this information, we can decode what type of message we've received, what MIDI channel was it on, which note was pressed, how hard was it pressed. So because we're just doing MIDI to CV, we're going to strip all of that back and just focus on note on and note off messages on one channel. But it's trivial to expand this and we will do in future videos. So the MIDI 1.0 protocol tells us to use this circuit to send MIDI signals from our cable to our microcontroller. And if we build that circuit up and have a look on the scope, we can see a MIDI message here. So the data sheet here just unhelpfully says to UART. So what the heck is a UART? In plain English, it's a device that's able to send and receive digital information one bit at a time. So our microcontroller has a UART built in. We just need to configure it correctly in the software and we're good to go. So if you want to follow along, you'll need this free software from ST Microelectronics called the STM Cube IDE, which I'll link down in the description. Once you've installed it and opened it, you need to set up a workspace directory and create a new project in that directory. We then want to find our specific board, which in my case is the Nucleo F303K8. And then we can name our project and say yes, yes, and it will open the automated setup environment, which will do a lot of the heavy lifting for us. OK, so this layout is actually showing us the pins on our microcontroller and we can graphically here set the device up however we want it. So we actually want two UARTs here, one to handle our MIDI messages and one to handle talking to the computer for debugging purposes. On this board, UART 2 is automatically wired into the USB port. So we'll use that one for talking to the computer and we enable that by setting this drop down menu to asynchronous. We're going to just leave everything else as default. So we're going to enable UART 1 the same way and just take a note that this A10 pin is set as the input so that's where that to UART goes so the output of our circuit from earlier gets attached to pin A10 on our microcontroller. The only thing that deviates from the standard is that we need to set the board rate to 32,500 symbols per second because that's the standard for MIDI. So now we just hit Control S and this tool will generate all of the code that we need to set the microcontroller up. OK, so let's just test it by printing something to the computer screen. Now, I'm going to warn you, we're going to be letting the software generate more code for us later on. So you see in the program where it says enter your code in here, user code goes here. Put your code there. Put your code inside there, because if you put it anywhere outside of these little guards, when we regenerate the code later on, all the code that you've written will be deleted. So in order to print, we need to include the standard IO library. So we go way up to the top and inside the user code guards, we put hash include standard IO. So what we'll do is we'll just add a little command in here just to say, hey, we've initialized the microcontroller and all is well. And the backslash N backslash R just takes us onto a new line. Then down at the very bottom, copy this piece of code out here, which we'll talk about in detail in just a minute. The HAL UART transmit line will tell the printf statement to use UART2 whenever I call printf. That's what this little chunk of code is saying. So we plug in the microcontroller and you might need to install this software called TerraTerm, which I'll link down in the description. And if you've got everything in installed and plugged in correctly, you should be able to open TerraTerm and find your microcontroller in this drop down list. Finally, we can right click on our project and go to run configurations and this will build the code. And then assuming you've got no errors, it will then program the microcontroller, which will boot up and print out our little initialization message. Woohoo!
So we used Hal UART Transmit to send a message via UART 2. So surely it's just a simple matter of using Hal UART Receive to receive our MIDI messages and then we're good to go. Well, yes and no. That is actually exactly what we're going to do. But the problem here isn't actually what code to run. It's when to run that code. I could just run this receive function and the microcontroller will sit there and wait for a MIDI message to arrive and that will work. But the problem is the microcontroller won't be able to do anything else while it's waiting. And we don't want that. So this is where interrupts coming. So an interrupt is a special signal that's sent from a peripheral, like our UR, directly into the CPU core. What this means is we can set up a special part of the CPU core to monitor the UR directly and tell us straight away when we've received a message. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at the receive buffer on UR1 and when that receive buffer is not empty, we know that we've received a message and we can trigger our code. So we navigate to our UART1 initialization function that the computer generated for us and inside the user code guards, don't forget that, we put the following code that I'm gonna show you. So what this is doing is it tells the NVIC, which is the part of the CPU that handles all the interrupts, to expect a signal from our UART. The next line of code tells the NVIC specifically what interrupt to monitor. If this code seems a little bit confusing, on my Patreon, I put up about eight to 10 hours of microcontroller tutorials where I program all of this stuff from scratch. If you want to know this stuff on a deeper level, then maybe check that out. I'll leave a link down in the description. Okay, so now we told the microcontroller when to execute this piece of code, we need to tell it what code to execute. So there's two stages to this. First thing we do is write an interrupt handler and then a callback function. So this is the interrupt handler section of code. So this section is called when any of the interrupts from UART1 fires. We just got a simple if statement that checks if the interrupt that has fired is the interrupt that we want to have fired. And if it is, it just calls this function and then we're done. So if the RXNE flag is high, that means we have received a MIDI message and we can run our MIDI received callback function. So we know from earlier that we're going to receive three bytes, which are eight bits each of information per MIDI message. So I'm just going to pop up to the top and I'm going to declare a temporary variable to store all three of those bytes in. So this line of code gives me an array of three eight bit memory locations and that's where we're going to store our MIDI messages temporarily. Next thing I need to do is declare a structure, which is essentially doing the exact same thing, but is much better for two reasons. First things first, I can label each byte so I can and keep track of what on earth everything is and secondly I can declare an array of these structures so I have a really nice neat and arranged way of storing a buffer of MIDI messages. This line of code for example will allow me to see the third element status byte. Notice how easy this is to read in the code and how clear it is what I'm doing. While I'm up here I'm going to declare these read and write headers for dealing with the buffer and make sure to initialize them to zero. We'll come on to that in a second. So going back down to our callback function and again if you want more information on how functions work and how C programming works and how microcontrollers work generally check out my patreon videos which I'll link down in the description but you can just copy this code here for now and I'll talk you through what each line does firstly we read from the UART so we pass the address of which UART we're going to read from where are we going to save the data how large is the message expected to be and we give it some timeout value just in case something goes wrong and the microcontroller hangs next we save the data from the temporary variable that we dumped it into from the UART into the appropriate place in the buffer so these three lines save our temporary variable variable into the buffer and then point the buffer to the next position ready to save the next MIDI message. So you see this counts from zero to our buffer length which I've declared up at the top and when it gets there it just wraps back around to zero and starts again. Next we put a function prototype at the top of our code so that the compiler knows what to do when it runs into this function in the code. Okay so after a fair amount of work we can now put the following lines of code in which will print out a received MIDI message to the computer. So we build up this circuit from earlier and we make sure we connect up the output of the opto isolator to the UART RX pin that we noted earlier. Then we boot up the microcontroller and it prints our messages to the screen. So we can see here I'm sending alternating note on and note off messages. So OX90 is a note on and OX80 is a note off. Just make sure to comment these lines out because printf statements are quite slow and slow enough to potentially cause problems in the code if we just leave them lying around. Okay so now we've received some MIDI data we need to tell the microcontroller to actually convert that MIDI data into an electrical signal that we can send to our synthesis. So how do we know if we've received a message? The while one statement essentially just enters an infinite loop that will loop around and around until the microcontroller loses power. So the first thing we're going to do is see if the read head is in a different position to the right head. Do you remember I incremented the right head when we'd received a MIDI message? So if we've incremented the right head but we haven't incremented the read head then that means we've received a MIDI message that we've not read yet. For now we'll just print the messages out and increment the read header the same way we did the right header so that will then read all the 
the messages out until we've caught up with that write header. This makes sure that when we've received any MIDI messages, we're reading them out as quickly as possible and in the order that we received them, which is obviously very important as well. Our controller is going to have three outputs, one trigger, one gate and one CV. So the trigger is a 10 millisecond pulse that lets the synth know that a key has been pressed. A gate is a signal that is high for the entire time that the key is pressed. And the CV is the actual voltage that we're going to send from our controller to our synthesizer. So as I mentioned, we're just going to worry about a monophonic synthesizer operating on only one channel for now. But in future videos, we're going to expand to polyphony and multiple channels and all of that lovely stuff. So what we need to do is we need to check our status byte and see if it's a note on message or something else. If it is a note on message, we need to begin the 10 millisecond trigger pulse, turn the gate high, and also change the output of the CV to reflect the correct voltage for the new note that we've just pressed. If it's a note off message, we simply turn the gate signal off and any other type of message just for now, we're gonna ignore. So let's go back to our .ioc file because we need to configure some more pins now so on the left here, we need to enable our DAC. This is the module that will output the actual voltage for our synthesizer. Go to analog, DAC1, and enable OUT1 configuration and leave everything else as default. Then we simply pick two spare pins for our trigger and gate signal. Click on two gray pins, make sure they're unused, and select GPIO output. This will enable the software to generate all the code that you need to set up the DAC correctly and drive those GPIO pins as outputs. Finally, we want to set up a 10 millisecond timer, which will allow us to have our trigger output. So we go timers, select timer two and set the clock source to internal. So under the clock configuration tab, you can see the sys clock of your board. So mine is eight megahertz. I want to divide this down so that my clock is counting at one kilohertz, which will increment my counter every one millisecond. And then I count to 10 and that's 10 milliseconds. So I divide my main clock by 8,000. We put in here 8,000 minus one or 7999, because this actually counts from zero to 7999 to divide it by 8,000. So now we want a 10 millisecond timer, not a one millisecond timer. So we need to count to 10. Again, we put 10 minus one here because we're going to use a counter that counts from naught to nine. I like putting 10 minus one because it means you can definitely see the number that you want to count to and it just gets rid of any silly mistakes that you might make. Finally, we go to the NVIC settings and we enable timer two global interrupts. This sets up all the interrupts available for the timer. Okay, so we hit control S to save our .ioc file and generate all the code that we need to set up our microcontroller. Easy peasy. So I mentioned earlier that if we're on channel one, a note on is OX90 and a note off is OX80. So let's keep things simple and only worry about those two messages and we'll define them at the top of our program. Then inside main, we want to define a variable to hold the note that we're currently on, which will be an 8-bit variable and a variable for the output voltage, which will be a 16-bit variable. Then we just write a simple if statement that checks the current read heads status byte for a note on message. Saving the data one byte as our current note if a note on is detected. Then we'll write a function to set the DAC to the correct voltage and a function that will turn on the trigger output for 10 milliseconds. Finally, we turn our gate signal on. So let's start with this DAC. My board has an internal voltage reference of 3.3 volts, which means that that's also the maximum voltage it can output. So I'm going to amplify that by three with an external analog circuit afterwards. This gives us just a hair under 10 volts, which allows us to cover all 10 octaves of the MIDI protocol at one volt per octave. So let's write this function. I'm going to call it calc ODR and it's going to return an integer, which will be the number that we're going to set the DAC to. The function itself is quite straightforward, it's only a few lines of code, but what goes in there depends really on your system. So we need to think about our volts per octave here first. So because there are 12 notes in each octave, that means we divide one volt by 12 and we get each note is represented by a voltage separated by 83.3 millivolts. So we remember we said earlier, I'm gonna amplify my output by three times, which means I actually need to divide my volts per octave value by three. If instead of my reference of 3.3 volts, your board has 2.048 volts at reference, for example, which is another common one, you would need to multiply that by five to get your 10 volts. So that would mean you would divide your 83.3 millivolts by five. So we then take our new volts per octave number and we multiply it by the MIDI note number itself. Then we multiply it by the number of levels in the DAC itself. So mine is a 12 bit DAC, which has 4,096 levels. If you have an eight bit DAC, that's 256 levels. And then we divide all of that 
by the internal reference voltage. So in my case, it's 3.3 volts. So then back in main, we set our volt variable equal to the output of this function. Then we use the hal dac set value function to simply set the dac to that value and boom, we're done. To run this, we pass in the address of the DAC, which you can just copy and paste from the DAC initialization code that your computer generated for you. We're then gonna use write alignment by writing DAC align 12BR. And finally, we pass it our volt value that we calculated earlier to set the actual value. We can see on the scope here that once I put my gain of three on the output, passing in octaves of C gives me a single volt step. Now we can also see one of the downsides of having digital circuits on these breadboards, we've got all this capacitance between the traces on the breadboard, we've got all these long cables causing all this inductance. On the control voltage signal, if I press a load of notes here at once, that's actually a MIDI message being coupled on to our CV signal. So we're kind of reaching the limit of how far we can go with these breadboards, which is why I'm partnering with JLC PCB so that I can help you guys get your hands on some really high quality and cheap PCBs. You can get a one to eight layer PCB from JLC PCB for as low as $2, which is insane. And viewers of this channel can follow the link that you'll find down in the description to get yourself $54 off your next JLC PCB purchase. So go down in the description, get your coupons, get your cheap PCBs, and I'll be partnering with JLC PCB to bring you lots of PCB design content coming very soon. And let's get back to the video. Okay, so we're really nearly finished programming this microcontroller now. All we need to do is set the logic to run the trigger and gate signals. Just as a reminder, the trigger is a 10 millisecond pulse that's fired on each note on, whereas the gate signal is a signal that is high while any key on the keyboard is pressed. Again, we could just turn the microcontroller on and tell it to wait for 10 milliseconds and then turn the output off. But just like earlier, Earlier, that means the microcontroller can't do anything for those 10 milliseconds. So if, for example, we were to receive a MIDI message then, there's a good chance we might miss that message completely. 10 milliseconds is a short time for a human, but an eon to a microcontroller, so we can't have that. So we're gonna set the output high when we receive a note message, start a timer, and then when that timer has elapsed, we'll call a callback function that will turn that output off again. We enable the interrupts globally when we set the timer up this time. We still need to let the CPUs end Vic know to expect an interrupt from our timer. And we do this exactly like we did it with the UART, only this time we say timer two instead of UART one. So let's write a function that does all of this stuff for us. I'm gonna call it trig10ms, and it doesn't take anything from main and it doesn't return anything either. So we're gonna start the timer off with this line of code and we're gonna pass it the address, which is the handle ampersand timer two. Then I simply turn the output on. So we pick one of the outputs from earlier. I'm gonna pick pin A7. So we say GPIO A for bank A, GPIO pin seven, for for pin seven and we're turning it on so we say gpio pin set these are all predefined and set up by the software earlier so you don't have to worry about anything else next we need to turn this output off when the timer elapses hal underscore tim dot h will show us all of the different callback functions that exist for this timer of which there are a lot we want to trigger this callback that calls when the timer period has elapsed we can just copy this bit of code and redefine it in our main we just check if the timer that elapsed is timer two just like with the ui earlier and then we simply write the GPIO to its reset state i.e. off and stop the timer because we're finished. So if we run this program and we stick an LED on the output, we can see clearly that this is not working how we intended it to. This is because we need to clear the period elapse flag, otherwise the interrupt handler is just calling the interrupt over and over and over and over and over again. We do this with a simple one-liner at the start of our trig function, which updates the status of this flag. Then the last thing we need to do is turn the gate signal on. So we'll simply turn on the other GPIO pin, pin A6, exactly the same way we did earlier, bank A, pin A6, GPIO pin set. Then we need to write an else if statement for the case when we haven't received a note on, we've received a note off. So we simply need to look at the data one signal, see if that note corresponds with the current note that we have on, and if it does, turn the gate signal off. We need to make sure we're not turning off the wrong note. If we press one note, then a second note, and then let go of the first note, we don't want to turn this note off. So we need to make sure the note off message that we've received corresponds to the current note on. Okay, so now we can see that our output corresponds to the correct voltage for our note. We have a trigger signal that triggers on every note on, and we have a gate signal that correctly lights up on each key press. Next time we'll be developing the analog electronics so we can convert our linear control voltage to an exponential one. For my patrons, all the schematics and codes are already up. In the meantime, check this video out to see the oscillator that this system was designed to feed, and I'll see you all next time. Bye.